Hello, my name is Christine Manning, and we're going to be talking today about behavior strategies that you can use in the classroom for your students that struggle with having good behavior. Um, I am uh, started my career in education about 12 years ago. I started as a paraprofessional, and then I got my special ed um, master's degree and worked as a teacher in a classroom for children with special needs. And then I was a principal for a while, and then I went out and did some consulting. So I've worked with special ed students primarily, but I've also worked with students that don't have any special education um, needs. Today, as we go through this PowerPoint, we're going to be referring to the LRBI manual. This is the Least Restrictive Behavior Intervention Manual put out by the USBE, the State Board of Education. There are several behavior interventions in this manual that we'll be referring to today, and so when we go through, I'll let you know when we're referring to this book. If you don't have this book and you're an educator or an LEA administrator, you will want this book. Right now, it's under revision and will hopefully be coming out in the fall of 2019 with um, some edits and some revisions in there, so we're excited for that. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Our objectives today are we're gonna talk about the mental health challenges and the impact it has on our schools. We're gonna talk about the function of behavior. Don't let this scare you away. This is gonna be a very basic presentation, but we are gonna discuss function of a behavior because it is so important to understand why a student is having a behavior so that we can know what interventions to put in place that will be most effective. We're going to review the LRBI crisis cycle. So as I mentioned earlier, LRBI stands for Least Restrictive Behavior Intervention. It's got a crisis cycle in the manual that will help you understand how a behavior escalates and de-escalates. We'll talk about the ABCs of behavior, A standing for antecedent, which is what would cause a behavior, B is the behavior, and then the C is the consequences that maintain or extinguish that behavior. And then we're going to talk about several evidence-based strategies used for behavior uh, management in classrooms. These are all evidence-based practices. Some of them we'll go through in a little bit more detail than others. So good mental health is not the absence of illness, but the possession of skills necessary to cope with life's challenges. So in 2001, the US Surgeon General defined mental health as the successful performance on mental function resulting in productive activities, fulfilling relationships with other people, and the ability to adapt to change and cope with adversity. There's a lot of components to having mental health, and in schools we see a lot of students that have challenges in mental health issues, and a lot of those times um, kids will have behaviors that are related directly to their, their status of their mental health. Kids, uh, children spend more time in schools than they do in any formal institutional structure. So schools play a key part in children's development from peer relationships and social interactions to obviously your academic attainment and cognitive progress, emotional control and behavioral expectations, and physical and moral development. So all of those components are recipro reciprocally affected by mental health issues. So when you go into education and say, I want to teach um, academics to students, we also teach many, many other things in addition to our academics that we teach to our children. We've got our social interactions, um, teaching children how to cope with emotional situations, and, and then obviously their physical and moral development. So all of those things we're responsible for if they affect the ch student's academic performance in the classroom throughout the school day. Um, as you probably have heard of IDEA, I-D-E-A, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that places a lot of the responsibility for student mental health um, on the education system. So especially for students who have mental health issues that are linked to their educational success. So if they cannot access their academics and make progress in the educational setting due to mental health concerns, then the LEA is responsible to provide whatever they need to in order for that student to make academic progress. So obviously we see a lot of disorders in schools. Um, I went through the DSM-5 and there's just a, a lot of different disorders that we see. Um, some that are more prevalent in schools in Utah right now anyway are autism, ADHD, communication disorders, trauma, 
depression, I was surprised at the statistics on depression. So this is for a major depression. So upwards of 20% of our adolescents are struggling with major depression. Um, and that is a, is a disorder that we see that has a huge impact on academic and, and social success. Um, anxiety, about one in 10 students suffer with anxiety. Intellectual disorders, PTSD or post-traumatic stress syndrome, specific learning disorders, OCD or um, obsessive compulsive disorders, motor disorders, bipolar, disassociative personality disorders, and, and many others. So as educators and as LEAs, we have a pretty big responsibility to make sure that we um, not only identify these students who, who we feel have some deficits um, in being able to achieve success in the academic setting, but also get them the support and, and the help that they need um, in order to be successful at school. So when we think about um, behavior, we know that behavior is communication, and whether you have a mental illness or a disability, um, behavior is communication for everybody. So these behavior strategies that we talk about today, um, they're all communication, no matter what a person struggles with or does not struggle with, we all have behaviors that say something. And so we're going to look at this in a holistic way, um, not just dealing with students that have a disability. This is f for all students. So I firmly believe um, that students will behave if they have the skills. Most of the time when I've worked with students, if they are exhibiting problem behavior, it's generally because they either don't understand the expectations of the setting that they're in, or they just really don't have the skills to be able to um, exhibit appropriate behavior. All misbehavior has an underlying cause. And so I put this picture of this little girl up here. If you've ever known a two-year-old, they are always asking why. You know, we say, we're going to the store. And they say, why? Because we need food. Why? Because we need to eat. Why? And so I'm hoping that as, as obnoxious as they, that may be, that you, when you're working with your students that are exhibiting a problem behavior, you're asking yourself why. What are they trying to communicate to me? Do they have the skills to be successful in this setting? Why does this keep occurring? And we're going to kind of go down through some um, reasons why that may happen and help you troubleshoot some behavior. So all behavior serves a function. Um, the four functions that are the most common are uh, it gets somebody out of doing something or an escape behavior. I'm sure you don't know anybody who ever throws a tantrum or has to use the bathroom when you hand out the math assignment. Um, another function is to get access to something. Sometimes that's attention. Sometimes that's access to an activity. Um, they may uh, exhibit a behavior to get a tangible item, um, such as a, a, a pencil or a fidget or, or a candy bar, something that they want or they may have a sensory function. And that I was going to talk a little bit more in depth about today, but I am not an occupational therapist and don't feel confident talking about that. So we'll talk a little bit about what sensory things are. But those are kids that are, um, you know, chew their pencil, chew their shirt, chew their shoe. I had a student that I worked with, and I, he had very oral um, high level of oral input needs. And I said, he came in from recess and I said, where's your shoe? And he said, I ate it. <laughs> and lo and behold, we went out to find his shoe and he had eaten pieces off of his shoe. So um, the, his behavior of eating his shoe and eating his shirt and eating his pencil and everything else that he would eat, he um, definitely had some sensory needs there that can be worked with through the assistance of your occupational therapist in your school district or your school, if you're lucky enough to have one there, um, to help you give appropriate strategies for those kids that have sensory needs. Um, so uh, an acronym that a lot of behavior analysts use is everybody eats. So escape, attention, tangible, sensory. And we're not going to go into a whole lot more detail in this slide, but as we go through, we'll talk about some of those in more detail. So all living organisms, no matter what it is, an animal, an uh, insect, a plant, all living creatures choose the path of least resistance. So when you look in nature, you see that plants will grow where there's water, where there's sunlight, where there's nothing in its way to grow. And human beings are the same way. We want to choose behaviors that give us the quickest resolution, 
for the least amount of effort and have the best reinforcers. And oftentimes we look at a situation or something we need to do and we kind of balance, give and take those three things to find the best resolution for us. So an example that I like to use is mowing the lawn. It's a hot summer day. I have very long lawn and I know I need to cut it, but it's really hot outside and the sun is out and I don't want to sweat and then have to come in and shower. And it's a lot of effort because now I've let my lawn get so long that it's going to take a little bit more time to mow. And what reinforcement do I get from that? I get to look outside and say, oh, my lawn looks great. <laughs> Hope the neighbors are, are pleased with my lawn. So when I'm thinking about that, um, I may choose to mow my lawn in the evening so that I have a cooler you know, atmosphere to mow the lawn. Um, the least amount of effort, maybe I hire my teenager for 15 bucks to say, hey, go out and mow the lawn for me, I'll give you 15 bucks. He probably doesn't mind doing it in the sun either, so that way I have a quick resolution. I have basically no effort. I have to go get $15 from the, from the bank. And the reinforcer is, I don't have to do it at all. I can pay somebody to do it. And I have great looking lawn at the end. So all of those components, when you're looking at behavior in an individual, we all choose the path of least resistance. And we all choose behaviors that are going to get us something quickly with the least amount of effort and have the best reinforcers for us. So as you're looking at your students with problem behavior, really looking at the function. Why are they engaging in that behavior? What are they trying to get? What are they trying to get out of? What is their consequence? And in today's um, presentation, we're really going to talk about um, preventative measures. We're not going to get too much into consequence measures because that's not the purpose of today's presentation. So I want to go over the crisis cycle. So as I showed you in the beginning of this presentation from the LRBI, the least restrictive behavior interventions that I hope you all have a copy of. And if you don't, you get one and new copy will come out this fall. Um, so I want to show you guys in this presentation, um, this is the cycle of crisis behavior. So we're hoping that when a student comes into school, which is not always true, but we're hoping they're in a calm state. That's this number one right here. Um, they're calm. They seem happy. They're on task. They're comfortable. They're participating in classroom activities. They're in an overall good mood. Um, this is the most important stage of our crisis cycle, obviously because there's no problem behavior and so we win there, but also because this is the stage in where you can teach new skills and also where you can really work on creating a good relationship with your students. So this is, a, this is the stage that as a staff, our goal is to keep kids in the calm stage as much as we can throughout the day. Um, as you see on the left side of your screen, the red arrow going up is the intensity of a behavior and across the bottom the horizontal axis is your time your timeline um, so as we said calm is where we want to keep our kids but sometimes they may have um, be dropped off at school and be in a triggered state or even in agitation or acceleration and and we're going to learn strategies today of what you can do as a staff member to help return them to a calm phase and try to keep them in a calm phase all day. So in our triggers, that's number two right here in our trigger section, this is the um, the phase of the cycle that um, it kind of triggers acting out behaviors. So a trigger is something that sets off the reaction where a behavior begins to escalate. So obviously there's a lot of things that can trigger students. Maybe just coming to school is already a trigger. The academics are too hard. The lights are too bright. Maybe the lights make noise. I don't know if anybody has ever heard that one before. But there's lots of things that can trigger our students. So there are two types of triggers that it discusses in the LRBI. There's school-based triggers and there's non-school-based triggers. So school-based triggers are things like conflicts. Maybe they got bumped in the hall. Maybe someone told them that their shoes were on the wrong feet. Whatever it might be, they've had some sort of a conflict and that trigger will set off the crisis escalation. Um, they may have a change in routine that they didn't expect or maybe they have a change in routine and they're doing something that is non-preferred. They may have had an interaction with a peer that was not, um, not satisfactory to them. 
a lot of our kids just have a lot of pressure just coming to school, especially if they deal with some kind of a disorder, sometimes just leaving the house and coming to school, getting dressed and coming to school is hard enough with all of the, the noises and the kids and you know fighting to get attention and all the things that they have to deal with. And then we hand them a math packet and say, welcome to school, here's your math. So lots of pressure when they, when they come to school. Um, sometimes they do not have effective problem solving skills or coping skills. This is something that we're going to talk about a little bit later as well. Um, or sometimes they face making a mistake and some of our kids cannot tolerate making a mistake or being corrected. So those are some school-based triggers that may occur to set off that crisis cycle for a student. Um, the other triggers, the other um, component is the non-school based. So non-school based it would be things that happen um, or that affect the student's behavior or mood when they're not at school. So some of our students come from high needs homes where there's not a lot of supervision or there's not adequate food or they don't get adequate sleep at home. Many of our students face health problems and, and just coming to school is uncomfortable for them because of all of the health problems that they're experiencing. Sometimes it could be nutritional needs, so not just eating food, but having nutritious food. And I'm sure that some of you adults know how you feel when you've had a bunch of crap for a day, maybe you're on vacation, and then you come back and you don't feel well, and you start eating those healthy foods again, those foods that give you nutrition, and you start to feel be better, your mental clarity is better, and you're just overall in a better mood. Um, it could be inadequate sleep. They may have du dual diagnoses, which a lot of our students um, with disabilities have multiple disabilities or multiple things that affect them and affect their achievement and their su success at school. Um, substance abuse and um, gang or deviant peer involvement. So those are some of the non-school based triggers that may be happening. So on our way up the escalation cycle, the third one is agitation. So agitation is where their behavior is beginning to either increase or decrease. So they may be getting angry, they may seem on edge, they may be frustrated or anxious, so they may be increasing in those behaviors. Or decreasing behaviors may mean they're, they may be upset in a depressed fashion, they may be withdrawn, they may be worried, I mean, sometimes anxiety pr um, does present itself in more of a depressed manner. So the reason our kids move into the agitation level of the crisis cycle is because they don't have the coping skills and the problem solving skills to handle the trigger and all of those things that upset them. So giving our kids coping strategies and problem solving abilities is going to help so that when they do come to school and they do have a problem or they run into something and they're triggered and they start moving up the skill to um, agitation or acceleration, they'll have the skills to say, you know what, something bad happened or something that I'm not um, really excited about happened to me in the hallway, but I have the skills to de-escalate myself so that I can go back to the calm phase and, and access my, my classroom and my academics. All right, so moving up from agitation, we have acceleration. So during the acceleration phase, a student becomes focused on, um, focused and directed behavior toward other people. So sometimes they may start to question you or argue with you, no, I'm not doing that they may be defiant or not um, comply with your directions. So here's where they start to become off task. So they may be a little bit belligerent, they may be argumentative, they may even um, whine and cry, they may provoke somebody else to get into an argument, they may threaten and intimidate, and sometimes they may even start some level of verbal abuse toward staff or peers. So the acceleration is kind of that final phase of the crisis cycle before a student really gets into the peak crisis behavior. So acceleration is that last that last phase of the cycle where we really have to put all of our efforts into um, decompressing that behavior and moving them back down the crisis cycle so that they can come back down to a calm phase and not let that behavior go into peak crisis behavior. 
So your peak crisis behavior is where kids become aggressive, angry, they may scream, they're irrational, they're out of control. The class generally cannot continue when a student is in peak crisis. They may threaten the safety of themselves or others. So here is where staff wants to make sure that everybody is safe and your schools will have protocols and procedures in place for what to do if a student is in a peak crisis behavior. So you may have behavior teams that you work in conjunction with. Um, you may have to evacuate the classroom. So whatever procedures your school has in place for when a student goes into peak crisis behavior, um, make sure that you know what those protocols are and you know how to implement them. Hopefully today you'll learn some skills where you can de-escalate um, problem behavior, problematic behavior, and you hopefully will never get to that peak crisis behavior. So hopefully the strategies we give you today will help prevent crisis. Um, phase number six, as you can see, is after the peak crisis subsides. So, so this is post-crisis. So in the de-escalation phase, they begin to disengage. They may be confused, they may try to reconcile, they may say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do those things. They may blame somebody else. Um, they may avoid you and they may avoid talking about the problem. And if they do avoid talking about the problem, that's okay. We don't want to re-escalate them back into a crisis behavior. We want to let them come down and recover as quickly as possible after they've had that peak crisis. So instead of sitting in an office working with a student that's just had you know severe aggression um, and saying why did you do that what were you thinking I can't believe you did you have all the skills to not do that what happened today so this is not the time to try to debrief with a student this is a time where you're quiet and you let the student think things through and you let the student kind of process things on their own this is not the time where you're saying it's time to write a sorry letter and make amends so um, the last stage of the crisis cycle is your recovery stage and this is where kids are beginning to calm down. They may not be as calm as they were in the beginning phase. They may be a little bit subdued and they may um, not want to talk to you. They may be embarrassed. There's a lot of emotions that go through when a student has had crisis behavior and some of them really do feel bad about it and some of them can tell you all the steps to avoid. Um, going into crisis behavior and and so the recovery piece can be um, a little tricky to get through if if your student is is feeling um, really bad about what happened but this is the place this is the time where you may have if it's appropriate and it's not going to put the kid back into a peak crisis this is the time where you will do um, some restorative justice practices. You may write a, a, an apology letter. You may restore the classroom. If the classroom was destroyed, you may go in and restore the classroom to um, a better state. A lot of times it can't be replaced um, exactly, but they can do a little bit with help and guidance and support. Um, not being stood over with your arms crossed in front of you, but saying, hey bud, let's go back into the classroom and I'll help you pick up the things that you, d you dumped out. So if um, if the student wants to make amends, this is the time to do that, and this is the time to give them opportunities and support in order to do that. So when students are um, in these three sections of the crisis cycle, the agitation, number three, the acceleration, number four, and the peak crisis, number five, they're under a great deal of stress. And I wanted to show you guys a slide on what stress does to your body. So here we have the physiology of stress. So this is what happens to our bodies when we are under stress. So as you have probably experienced before, your pulse increases, you start to breathe heavy, your hands may sweat, you may feel like sometimes when I'm under extreme stress, I almost feel like I'm gonna have a heart attack just because I, I'm so worried or I'm so stressed out that my heart's just racing so fast and I, I feel really anxious. Um, your endorphins and your adrenaline all increase. So while your body is, is working so hard to increase your pulse rate, your respiration, your adrenaline, you're in a fight mode. And what happens is it takes all of your blood and all of your uh, 
resources from your brain and it sends it to your body so that you can run, so that you can fight. So your brain, your communication decreases, your reasoning decreases, your compromising and your listening skills, they all decrease. So if you guys have ever been in an argument with maybe a, a partner, a spouse, a, a sibling, a child, you guys have probably said things and, and maybe even done things that you think, that that's totally unlike me, I would never do that. I can't believe I said that. And that's because you're, you're getting ready for fight or flight. And so your brain is not working as well as it would normally if, if your adrenaline and your um, pulse and respiration are all increasing. So, um, so how can this help you when dealing with your students? And so um, I, I really feel like this is important to understand the physiology of stress because I think a lot of times our kids will get up into this acceleration or peak crisis behavior and we start offering choices. So, um, or we start trying to reason with them. This, these points in the crisis cycle are not the time to give choices. They're not the time to reason with a student. And so understanding where their brains are and, and what's happening to them um, biologically will help you to make better choices. And instead of aggravating a behavior that looks like it may happen, you can do things to hopefully decelerate that behavior instead. So I want to talk about the ABCs of behavior, and I know this is a little bit of terminology. I'm trying not to give too much, but um, I think it's important for this presentation that you understand what an antecedent is, if you don't already. Um, an antecedent is what happens right before the behavior. It usually causes the behavior to occur, and it answers the question sometimes why the student is doing what they're doing. Um, so then we've got your behavior, and that's what the student does. So behavior to a behavior analyst is something that is observable and measurable. So if you say the behavior is um, non-compliance, what are we measuring with non-compliance? So if you say the behavior is he puts his head down on his desk when I hand him his worksheet, then the behavior is putting his head down when handed a worksheet. It's not non-compliance. Maybe he's tired. He's not non-compliant. Maybe he can't understand the directions and he won't ask for help. I'm sure no one has ever had a student like that before. So he lays his head down on his desk. Is he non-compliant? Well, I guess technically, yes, he is. But why is he having that behavior? So we want to make sure that behavior, when we talk about that, it's observable, uh, observable and measurable. So if a student um, has a temper tantrum, you definitely can observe a temper tantrum. What happens while well, they're on the floor kicking? Kicking is observable and measurable. You can measure how many times he kicks. He's screaming. That's observable and measurable. You can count how many screams he exhibits or you can measure how long he is screaming. So instead of saying tantrum for a behavior, make sure that you're writing down what that looks like and, and you're able to measure that behavior. And then your consequence obviously is something that happens after a behavior. So it's in direct relation to the behavior happening. So the consequence happens because of the behavior. And we're not really going to talk about consequence interventions today. What I really want to focus on is antecedent interventions today so that we can prevent behavior. So if we spend our time working on A, the antecedent, and making the situation at school the best we can for each of our students, then we will see less B, problem behavior. So we want to work on the front end and not on the back end. Delivering consequences is a lot more difficult with children, especially um, if we're trying to deliver, if we're trying to stay with things that are positive. So in education, I, I firmly believe that avoiding the problem behavior by working on antecedents and interventions on the antecedent way is the best way we can go. So here's an example. Um, the antecedent we can look at where the uh, where did it happen? The, where did the behavior happen? Who was there and what was said or done immediately before? So when we're looking at a behavior, we're looking at what happened right before that behavior. Where was the student? Who else was there? What was said? What was done? Was there a homework assignment given? What was happening right before that problem behavior? Um, the behavior is what we just talked about, what the student did, observable and measurable, or what the student said. 
And then the consequence were what happened after the behavior? What were the students' reactions? What was the instructor's reactions? Did the kid go to timeout? Did the kid get a sticker? What kind of things happened as a consequence directly related to that behavior? So an example here is the class is ending free time. So free time is over class. Now I'm going to hand out a science test. Um, that stinks <laughs> to move right from free time to an exam. And test for a lot of our kids is a four letter word. They don't want to take a test. They are stressed out enough and then you say the word test and they really freak out. So we want to make sure that we're going from um, preferred activities to maybe non-preferred activities in a more systematic way. So the behavior of this student in, that we're speaking of, she is going to hide under the desk and start screaming. So when we see the behavior, we can see that she's hiding under the desk. That's observable. And we can see that she's screaming. And screaming is measurable. You can um, count or count duration of how long she is screaming. Well, why is she screaming? What happened right before? What was the antecedent? Well, the class ended free time and the teacher said she was gonna hand out a science test. Could that have anything to do with her behavior? Um, maybe, it, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And that's where you're going to be a detective and really look at the behavior and what's happening right before to determine why it's happening. So the consequence in this situation, the teacher reprimands the student, says, get out from under the desk, get up in your seat, everything's fine, all the classmates are watching. If that student was wanting attention from the classmates, she sure got it because she got attention not only from the teacher, even though the teacher was delivering a reprimand and maybe wasn't super happy with her, if a student is, is desiring attention, negative attention is better than no attention and she'll take it. And also the classmates are watching. So she's getting attention from the whole room when she hides under the desk and screams. So consequences will either maintain a behavior or they extinguish a behavior. And so it's important that we know what the function of the behavior is so that we know how to try to handle as much as we can the consequences. But as I said, we're gonna mostly work on the antecedent end today. So, um, so why should we care about antecedents and consequences? So the more we understand why a student is exhibiting problem behavior, we can attempt to change the antecedents and consequences so that we avoid that behavior from happening again. So on the last slide, possible reasons the child is screaming and hiding under the desk. Well, if she was trying to get attention, the consequence in that last slide sure gave that to her. She got attention from, t from teacher and classmates. If her behavior was happening and you say, why was this behavior happening? And you say, well, she was avoiding the science test. She was avoiding ending free time. She did not want it to end. She did not want to do a science test. So if she screams and hides under the desk, that is going to at least prolong the science test from occurring. So, so really looking at why your students are exhibiting problem behaviors. And, and in this PowerPoint, like I have mentioned, we're gonna try to change the antecedents so that we can help that behavior not happen. So strategy number one, these are all evidence-based behavior interventions that you can use with any child. There's strong evidence to um, support their use in special education classes, but really they work with anyone. All of the interventions that we talk about here can be used with your spouse, your partner, your children, your coworkers, and your students. So it works with everybody. So strategy number one, this is the most important by far. It has a very high effect size. If you're familiar with John Hattie's work, I think it's got an effect size of 0.72. It is a very strong um, evidence-based practice for um, reducing problem behaviors and for increasing academic engagement in our students. So building and maintaining a strong relationship. So this can be for some people really easy to do. They walk into work and they talk to their coworkers and they ask them how they're doing and how their weekend was and they allow them to talk and they listen and they they praise and they do all those things. For students, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult, especially students that you feel like you don't connect with, and especially for some teachers, um, creating a relationship with a student who has chronic um, problem behaviors or aggression is really sometimes a hard thing for those teachers to do. But I promise you, if you put a lot of energy into this one strategy, your problem behaviors will decrease um, a lot in your classroom. 
So it's important to have strong relationships because the students will listen to you. And you want them to listen to you because you're their teacher and they need to learn from you. So if they're listening to you, they're going to be more engaged in doing what you ask them to do. They'll want to be around you. It makes you more effective in helping them achieve their goals. It's a much more pleasant environment if you have strong relationships with the people that you're stuck in a room with all day. It's a good example for other staff and for the individual to learn how to build and maintain a strong relationship with other people. It highly, highly reduces the likelihood of crisis behavior happening. Um, De-escalation and post-crisis strategies, if there was a crisis behavior, the post-crisis strategies are far more effective when you have a good relationship with a student and it reduces the rates of truancy and absenteeism. And that is especially true in our, in our um, high school settings. A lot of our kids, they get a car and they don't have to be at school if they don't want to be, or they live close to home, or they have a friend that lives close to the school, and they're going to leave campus because they don't have any reason to be there. There's not any strong connection with anybody um, to keep them on campus. And a teacher can make all of the difference. I was talking to a, a, a teacher that's... Um, um, at one of the schools I was working with and she had mentioned that one of her high school teachers was the only reason she went to school every day because this high school teacher was happy to see her and gave her positive feedback and was friendly with her and the um, the woman I was speaking with said you know I didn't have any friends and I I could have taken school or left it I really didn't want to be there but I knew that that teacher was counting on me to be there and she was checking up on me and she was seeing how I was doing and that teacher um, was the reason that this individual was able to graduate high school she feels like if she didn't have that one teacher to make all that difference that she may not have graduated at all um, I worked with a, a member of a gang. He was a high school student. He was also a part of a gang here. And um, I was called in to help with this student and I worked with his teachers. And I think the teachers wanted me to come in and put a plan in place to make this kid do what they wanted him to do. And the first time I met with the teachers, what we discussed is um, creating a strong relationship with this student. So the first assignment that I gave them was that I did not want them to ask him where he was. I did not want them to tell him how much work he had missing. I did not want them to ask him, you know, where his missing assignments were, or what he was helping with, or get to work, nothing like that. All I wanted those teachers to do was to say, hey man, I'm glad you're here. It's good to have you in class today. And, and talk to him like he's a person. Find out what he, um, what he likes, what he does at home for fun. Um, anyway, all of the teachers put some effort that first week into building a strong relationship with this student. He had very high rates of truancy and absenteeism, but we met a week after we had started just this simple intervention, and all of the teachers said he was in class more, and most of the teachers had an assignment turned in by him. And they said, some of the teachers said, I've never had an assignment turned in by this student ever before. Well, it makes students want to listen to you and want to be around you when you have a good relationship with them. So of course, if he feels like there's a connection there, he's going to listen to the teacher and he's going to turn assignments in even when he's not being asked because he wants to have a good relationship with that teacher. Having a good relationship with your students is the number one most important thing that you can do to improve behavior. The research shows that poor relationships between teachers and pupils are a predictor of the onset of childhood psychiatric disorders and of low academic attainment. That statement is so powerful to me for a couple of reasons. One, a poor relationship with the teacher. You think about your elementary school teachers. Did you ever have a teacher that maybe just didn't like you? I had a teacher that just really didn't like me when I was in elementary school and I never had bad behavior prior to this teacher and I never had bad behavior after I had this teacher. But while I had this teacher, I would do things like not hear the bell um, when it was time to come in from recess and I would stay out and sometimes I would try to coax other students to stay out with me. 
um, because I knew she didn't like me and because of the way she treated me, I started to act out and I had never done that before. I'm very much a people pleaser and, and want people to um, be happy with what I'm doing. And she obviously wasn't happy no matter how hard I tried. And so I quit trying. And not only did I quit trying, I also started engaging in other problematic behaviors because I knew she didn't like me anyway. Um, so, so that relationship goes a long, long way. Um, predictor of the onset of, of childhood psychiatric disorders, that is worrisome when you know that a poor relationship um, by the teacher can be a, a predictor of, of an onset of that. And then obviously your low academic attainment. And, and kind of similar to the story I just told you about myself, um, you know, I wasn't trying to get good grades. I wasn't trying to do good things because I couldn't make the teacher happy no matter what I did. So positive relationships truly have the ability and the power to unleash untapped potential in our students. So I really feel like relationships and your effective instruction go hand in hand. Um, and we're going to talk about effective instruction in just a few minutes. But the research shows that if you have a positive relationship with your student, their test scores will increase, their grade point averages will increase, there's some research out there to support that even their IQ will increase, and then their motivation and academic engagement will increase because they want to make you happy, they want to please you, they want you to be happy with them because you're friends. Um, there's also huge decreases in problem behavior, absenteeism, truancy, and suspension and discipline procedures. So your relationship with your students is of utmost importance and if you can spend some time doing that I think you'll be ahead of, of the game. So here's some strategies that you can use. I've had some teachers that have said, gosh I don't know what to do to, to create a relationship with my students. I don't really have time. And, and my kind of argument to that is you really don't have time not to. Um, you will save so much time during your school day keeping kids on task and reducing problem behaviors if you have good relationships with these kids and a little bit of time goes a long long way so some of these strategies are to stand at the door of your classroom in the morning and after recess and after lunch stand at the door and greet the students as they enter the classroom and call them by name so and tell them hey Cindy I'm glad you're at class today I missed you yesterday were you sick you know, oh, I'm glad you're feeling better. I'm glad you're here. I miss you when you're gone. It makes a big difference um, when, when you give them some attention like that. Establishing firm boundaries. So just because you are friendly to a student does not mean that you have to be friends. There are still boundaries. There are still rules. And kids want boundaries and kids want rules. But they will push up against them from time to time just to see if your boundaries are still firm and still in place. So have your firm boundaries and don't be afraid to say, oh, you know what, that is not how we line up. Let's try that again. And, and making sure that they know where those boundaries are. So spend time talking about the things that they enjoy and listen to them. So if they enjoy cars and they went to a car show over the weekend, take interest in the things that they're doing. What was your favorite car you saw while you were there? What did you do? Did you get a churro? <laughs> you know, um, talk about things that they love to, to talk about and, and listen to them. And this is also really helpful when it's time to choose reinforcement or work with the student to choose reinforcement for them. They will, you'll know they like cars. Maybe you get car stickers or maybe they earn points that convert to dollars so that they can go to a car show. So um, knowing what they like and what they enjoy and what they spend their free time doing will also help you come up with ideas for reinforcers for them. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So tell them about yourself. Make a connection with them. I remember when I told my third grade students that I had a family and a house and children and pets. They all thought I slept at school and that was all I did. I woke up and taught my students and loved my students and then they left and went home and I don't know where they thought I got my food, maybe from the school cafeteria. And then I guess I curled up on a blanket and, and went to sleep on my classroom floor. Um, they were really surprised when they found out that I had children of my own and, and a, a home that I went to. And um, teaching them about myself and making those connections with them. Also, uh, you know, in discussing myself with them, I told them the mistakes that I've made and that I've done things just like they've done. 
and and maybe a kid you know hit another student on the playground and when I have to talk to them I said you know what I did the same thing when I was your age and I learned that it was wrong and I learned that it hurts people's feelings and I learned that I won't have friends if I hit my friends and then I tried not to do it that ever ever again and then they have that connection with you like oh my teacher has made mistakes too and and she turned out okay I guess um, that just that you understand where they're coming from so spend time doing things with them a lot of kids like to go take a walk or go out and shoot hoops having lunch with a student or a group of students maybe they earn that um, but spend time doing things with them that they enjoy um, is is really important and then your reinforcement so this can be praise um, and I think we talk about praise in a little bit but praising students telling them the things that you like that they're doing and how proud you are of them if praise is reinforcing for a student then those behaviors that make you happy will continue to happen by that student. The drive-by reinforcement is maybe when a student is sitting and working instead of disrupting the class or disrupting the the flow of the student um, working so well you may just walk by their desk and give them a high five or a pat on the back or a thumbs up something like that that means I'm proud of you and what you're doing and so sometimes you don't have to say anything at all you can just kind of do a little drive-by praise. Show pure appreciation um, especially our kids that are in the upper grades in high school, you know, it, some of them that deal with any type of mental illness, and even if they don't, everybody likes to feel appreciated. So I appreciate you being on time. I'm glad you're at school today. I appreciate you turning your homework in. I know that's hard for you to get that done last night. There's been so much um, with all the end of term testing and everything. So I appreciate getting that done. Um, so make sure that you show appreciation. And, and a lot of times, People want to feel valued and appreciated, and that will increase their positive behaviors. Respect their individuality. Respect who they are and, and what they're doing and their ways of showing that they're uh, an individual. They may have blue hair. They may be pierced. They may have all kinds of different things, but they're a person, a person with feelings and a person who wants to be successful. And so respect their individuality. Offer reassurance. So this is really important with some of our kids with, you know, say anxiety or obsessive compulsive um, disorders. Just saying it's going to be okay, and I'm going to help you get through this. And sometimes I have anxiety too, and and thank goodness we don't feel this way forever. But what are some coping strategies that we can put in place to help you feel better? And I'm going to help you get through this. And let them know that you're there to support them, and you want them to be successful. And reassure them that they're going to be okay. Empathize with their situations. Like I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's just hard for our kids to get out of bed and come to school with all of the pressures that they may have in just life and dealing with their own disabilities or their own um, life sometimes is just overwhelming. So try to empathize with them, know where they're coming from, know what some of their situations are at home so that you can be as receptive as you need to to their, their needs on a daily basis. And then pa pair yourself with po powerful reinforcers. So pairing yourself is just putting yourself with something else that the kid likes. So if the kid likes to listen to music, you may sit and listen to music with him. Or you may sit and say, oh, I really like that band too. Did you know that they sang this song? And so pairing yourself um, with something that they like helps you become a reinforcer as well. So if they like music and you pair yourself with the music so you're with them when they're listening to the music, you talk to them about their music, then when the music is not available to them at that moment, you will become that reinforcer without the music. So it's just a way of, of pairing yourself to, to become reinforcing to um, your students. <clears throat> and then be flexible and understanding. A lot of times our kids you know, may struggle with being tardy, with um, wearing the right clothes that are appropriate to school, all kinds of different things. Try to be as flexible as you can and as understanding as you can and help them to be successful. If there's one thing that I really want to get across today is, you know, we're not here to fix behaviors, we're not here to fix kids or make them fit into this box that we all need to have them fit into. We're here to help them be successful. Academically, socially, emotionally, out in the community, all of those things are important to their whole um, existence. So an important tip, 
try to use a ratio of five to one positive interactions, not to negative interactions, but to redirections or correctives. So a positive interaction will have, um, let's just say, uh, one point. So if you think about this as a bank account, every positive interaction will have will be uh, one dollar added to your bank account. So you say, I'm glad you're at school. There's one dollar. You say, thank you for turning in your homework. There's one dollar. Say, you got your math done on time. I'm so proud of you. There's one dollar. So that's three dollars. But then if you say, why are you sitting on the floor? That can be a debit of five dollars, depending on that student. So a lot of times your credits are small increments of increase, but your debits are usually a large amount of, of decrease in that bank account. And you think about that in your own personal relationships when you're getting a positive um, interaction with somebody that you care about and they're, they're putting credits, they're putting dollars into your bank account. And you may have a lot of money in there because they're so wonderful to you. But then those times that they take out a, a, a debit and they do something that's not so nice to you, it has a huge, profound impact on that bank account. It can wipe the whole bank account out depending on you know, the interaction and what is said and what is done. So just realize that your negative interactions um, are, are far more draining on your relationship than the positive um, is to promote credit in that bank account. So it's vital that you flood with positives all day long if you can. And that way if you have to deliver a corrective action or if you have to deliver a, a redirection, the student has reserves and they're not going into the red. So I tried to put some things that maybe we say to our students in a, maybe a debit format and then I just changed that to a, a credit format. So instead of saying, hey, you got that answer incorrect, you could say, hey, let's work on this problem together. So it's supporting them, it's promoting their success instead of telling them that they got incorrect and they may want to you know, try that one again. So why are you out of your seat? Um, probably for a lot of our kids, debit, and how many times do you say that to some of our students maybe who struggle with ADHD or who need, uh, require a lot of movement, they may be out of their seat a lot. And if you're saying, why are you out of your seat? Get in your seat. Where's your seat? <laughs> that can be very draining on your relationship. So instead of saying that, you can say, hey, I appreciate when you're in your seat. Thank you for being in your seat. Let me help you find your seat. <laughs> um, maybe you can't sit down, so maybe we put some duct tape on the floor around your desk so that you can stand up. You just stay in your area when you're standing up. And that way you can be out of your seat as much as you want, as long as you're in your area. Um, another debit is you need to be quiet. Please be quiet. Um, and credit would be thank you for having a quiet voice or let's talk in a quiet voice, things like that. Debit would be where's your homework? Did you get your homework turned in? Why didn't you turn in your homework? You never turn in your homework, things like that. And it says, hey, let me find, help you find your homework. Let's check your backpack or let's check your locker. Let me help you. So all of the credit things, just the way you word something to somebody, isn't meaning you can't ask them to get their homework turned in. It doesn't mean that they don't turn it in often. It means let me help you so that you can be successful and so that we can continue to have a good relationship. Strategy number two is basic needs. Um, unmet biological needs often result in changes in behavior. You guys may have heard the word hangry before, and I know that my husband, when we're on family vacation, will say, uh, hey, mom's getting hangry, we better pull over and get her some food. And I, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about, hangry. I'm fine and I probably am hangry. And it just makes all of those little triggers, remember in our crisis cycle, those little triggers become bigger triggers when you're hungry or when you're tired. So as an adult, you guys have probably all experienced this where maybe you're dealing with lack of sleep or, or you haven't eaten all day and then maybe one of the littlest things can just set you off. Well, a lot of our students you know, they may not eat breakfast. They may take medication that interferes with them feeling hungry or them wanting to eat. Many, many of our students that have um, any matter of these disabilities have a difficult time sleeping. And they may want to sleep all day, but at night they can't sleep and they're up walking around the house. Um, so making sure that you know if your student's basic needs are met 
And as you see in this diagram here, if you have not met the requirements of adequate sleep and nutrition and water and restroom things, you can't even get up to um, being able to um, being able to focus on an academic task. So make sure that your kids are are have the support that you can give them at school. And I know there's lots of principals who will um, put money out to make sure that kids are fed in the morning if they don't have access to food. And I know that there's free breakfast and lunch programs at the State Board of Education where uh, LEAs can sign up for um, free breakfast and lunch if they have a certain uh, percentage of students on free and reduced lunch and they meet some qualifications. So really make sure that your kids have as many things as you can address at school to help them make sure that those needs are met. Um, you can do this a lot of times, especially in elementary school, you may have a morning check-in or a circle time where you may ask your kids, show me how you're feeling today. And the kids can do a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Those kids that do a thumbs down, you may want to ask them, maybe not in front of the whole group, but maybe ask them, you know, what can I help you with so that you can have a thumbs up day. And so what, what, what do you need? Did you have breakfast? Did you sleep well? And if they didn't, then give them more breaks throughout the day. Give them some healthy snacks that provide nutrition, not just fill the belly, but provide nutrition to them. Um, sensory needs, I put in with basic needs because I feel like sensory needs are a huge distraction to learning if your sensory needs are not met. So earlier we were talking about that student who just chewed on everything. He could not access his curriculum because he was too busy finding something to chew on to fill that sensory need that he had. So making sure that as a teacher you're aware if a student is chronically out of their desk or chronically putting things in their mouth or crying a lot or depressed. I mean things that are not normal for uh, that level, that age group of kids. So if they're doing things that are out of the ordinary, please check with your occupational therapist in your district or in your school and, and get some things put in place whether the kid has special needs or not. They may need some um, replacement behaviors to fill those sensory needs so that they can access their curriculum and so that they can be successful. Strategy number three is your expectations in your classroom management. So as I mentioned earlier, the LRBI, the Least Restrictive Behavior Intervention Manual, does have a classroom checklist. I love this checklist for teachers. It will just let you know if you have things in place in your classroom that um, will promote the, the success of your students. And so you go through there and you go through the checklist and you say, yes, I have this in place. I'm doing really well with this. And oh, I, I didn't even think to do, to do this one. And, and it may give you some goals of how you can set up your classroom to promote student success. And obviously if our students are experiencing success and we have set expectations in the, the classroom up in a manner that they can experience success, they won't have as many problematic behaviors. So um, go to the LRBI, it's online. You can look up LRBI USBE and it will Google, um, will take you to our least restrictive behavior intervention manual and it has that classroom checklist in there. It's a good check for teachers just to kind of see where you are and, and maybe what you need to do. So I'm just going to go over a few of the things here. This is not directly out of the LRBI but I didn't want to spend too much time but I want to make sure that we <clears throat> discuss physical space and layout of the classroom. So making sure that every student has a space for them, they have adequate space. The layout of the classroom is easy enough so that students can access the coat rack, the places to turn assignments in, um, places to line up, places to have maybe rug time or story time, that the physical space of the classroom is laid out in a manner that promotes student success and we don't have kids running into each other not knowing where they're supposed to be, not knowing where to get supplies and kind of roaming around. So the physical space is really important. Having spaces for individual work or group work, free choice space, where do they have to be to have free choice time? Is there a calm area or a decompression, decompression area in your classroom? 
Where do you keep supplies? What are the expectations for students getting those supplies? Where's the teacher desk? I know when I taught elementary school, I had to put a little bit of duct tape on the floor to say to the kids, this is my two feet of the classroom and you cannot come back here and sit on my lap. Um, I, I need to have my, my space that, that is the teacher space and there's private things back here. So delineating the teacher space is important. Uh, making sure that the students' desks are facing the area of instruction. I can't tell you how many times kids get in trouble because the teacher is delivering instruction and the student is facing the back of the room or the students are facing the middle of the room and they're distracted by the kid across from them who's picking his nose or who's making weird noises. Um, hard for a kid to receive instruction if they cannot view the instruction area and view the teacher. Also, it's good if teachers can see the kids' faces because then they know. Are they daydreaming? Are they engaged? Um, if they're not facing you, then you have a hard time knowing how to deliver your instruction because you don't know if the students are engaged or not. <clears throat> also making sure with the layout of the student's desk that you can access the students. So when you're walking around delivering instruction, you can have closer proximity to those kids, especially if they are exhibiting more problem behavior and they're starting to escalate or they're joking around. A, a teacher going over and standing there will generally put the kibosh on that um, and students will will stop that behavior because the teacher's close. So making sure that you have a good physical design in your classroom is the first step in having a successful classroom. Um, number two there is develop a class schedule and review it daily. So I noticed that in elementary school our teachers are really great about doing this. In our um, older our, our middle school and high schools a lot of times there is no class schedule and the kids don't know what we're doing and the kids aren't sure of what's coming next that increases anxiety in in a lot of our kids so making sure that you have a class schedule on the board and a routine of the classroom um, which kind of goes into number three but maybe you have the same routine so the kids come in for um, English class and the first thing you're going to do is you're going to work on comprehension by listening to a story then you're going to work on um, fry words then you're going to work on vocabulary then you're going to have the instruction and you're going to have the teacher giving instruction and then we do instruction together we practice and then the you do you get an individual assignment um, and when they're done with that assignment they have choices of, of what they can do for their free time and they know exactly where to go how to get their supplies, what the expectation is, and it's not always just read a book um, because that's not super effective, um, maybe if, for a few minutes, but we don't want to have that be the go-to every time is just go get a book. But have um, language file folder games and have spelling words that they can draw pictures to or they can practice their spelling words by um, play with using Play-Doh, some different things that they can do if they finish their um, individual work and that will also be something they can look forward to which will make them want to finish their individual work because they get to play with Play-Doh and even though they're doing spelling words they still are playing with their Play-Doh. Um, another note I wanted to make on this is to make sure that your students know what the objectives are. So we come to class and we want to know what are we learning today? What is the expectation that my teacher has of me today? Um, I, I was thinking you know what if we invited everybody to a, a teacher um, training and we had everybody sign up for the teacher training and we gave you the location and we said we're gonna provide really awesome training and it's gonna be super fun and so you come to the training and you sit down and you're saying I, I don't know what we're learning I don't know what I'm here for are we talking about instruction and effective instructional strategies or are we talking about you know behavior what are we talking about I don't even know why I'm here or what I'm going to learn what's the expectation of me what am I coming away with so making sure your objectives are written in, in student friendly terms on the board and that you review that and you say today we're learning about fractions and we're gonna learn all about fractions and it's gonna be super fun if you put super fun in front of anything especially in elementary school then it's super fun and they're all excited so making sure that you review your daily schedule and really it only takes a minute but if you have a change in the schedule that's really important for students to know at the beginning of the class period so if you know that you're in sixth period and you guys are leaving early to go to an assembly you're gonna want your students to know that at this time 
we are going to be leaving to an assembly and maybe even review assembly behavior for those students so that they can be successful in the, the assembly. But at least they'll know what's coming instead of just now we're doing this, now we're doing this, now we're doing this. They'll, they'll know the, the procedure and the expectations in the classroom. So establish expectations, rules, and consequences. So the U that's on this PowerPoint stands for a universal strategy, which is in the LRBI, and it is number 19. So universal strategies are generally strategies that you can employ for your whole classroom. So expectations, rules, and consequences are something that every classroom should have um, and, and the kids should know. So your rules will want to be posted and the kids should know what the rules are. And especially as the kids get into middle school and high school, are the rules the same in the science room as they are in the PE setting? Are the rules the same in the library setting? So what are the rules very explicitly for those students in that, in that setting? <clears throat> and then a lot of um, LEAs are, are writing lists down of consequences. So if you follow the rules and if you do what's um, required of you, then these are all the great things you'll get. You may get to play a file folder game. You may get to do spelling words with Play-Doh. You may get to pull your phone out and look at your phone for a couple of minutes. Um, negative consequences would be things like um, you did not get a chance to finish the assignment. And let me add in here that that is with teacher support and teacher differentiation. Um, and really trying to promote student success here. But if a student doesn't get done with the work and the consequences to miss a minute or two of recess, then they know that. And they know that they have to miss a minute or two of recess. And, um, and then you can be the good guy instead of the bad guy. So instead of saying, oh no, you didn't fish, finish your assignment, you have to miss a couple of minutes of recess, you get to say, oh no, what's the consequence for that? And the kid knows because it's posted and you've reviewed it. And the kid says, I have to miss two minutes of recess. And then the teacher can jump in and say, you know what, but I'm going to help you. Let me get everybody outside and I'm going to sit with you and I'm going to even give you the answer to number one just to get you started. So you can kind of be the um, superhero instead of the villain as far as negative consequences go. Manage your instruction. There are 10 effective teaching strategies that John Hattie goes over in his, his book, Visual Learning. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that, but if your instruction is fun and engaging, your kids will probably be engaged and, and learning. Um, I think it's a really good idea, if you haven't yet, to video yourself delivering instruction so that you can see how effective you are. Because sometimes I'm delivering instruction and I think, oh man, that was a really great lesson. That was fun. I had a lot of kinesthetic activities in there. I had funny games. I had a couple of funny video clips. And then I might look back at that teaching portion of the day that was recorded and say, oh, it wasn't as great as I thought it was. <laughs> um, and there was a lot more off-task behaviors than I thought there were. And so maybe watching some videos of yourself delivering instruction will give you some feedback as far as what you could do to make your instruction more engaging and fun. Um, keep unstructured time at a minimum. This is super important for all kids because if there's a void, they'll fill the void. And if they fill the void, sometimes, probably most times, it's with things that aren't aren't good. So you want to make sure that unstructured time is kept at a minimum and if there is free time that it's just not a free-for-all but they know during free time you can choose one of these five activities and they're all activities that they know how to get, how to use, how to clean up, where to put them when they're done. Um, so it's not unstructured time, it's structured free time um, to reduce challenging behaviors and that time where you can have some problems pop up. So if students are actively engaged in learning and instruction, problem behaviors will be at a minimum. They won't occur as much, especially if you have good relationship with the kid too. So in your classroom, making sure rules are realistic, they're age appropriate, and they're developmentally appropriate to the students in your room. They're consistent across settings and activities. I have to say this is much easier, I think, in elementary school than it is in middle schools and high schools. But what are the expectations of your students in those different settings. They're explicitly taught. This means they're not just told to the student, but they're taught. There's examples and non-examples. There's different scenarios. They get to practice. They get to role play and really um, learn what is expected for them. 
and they're stated in a positive manner. So instead of don't run in the hallway, you can put on their walking feet or safe feet or whatever you want to do so that those rules are, are written in a positive manner. They're discussed. I always had a classroom discussion the first day or two of school. Um, my students made up their own rules and their own consequences. They're much more difficult and hard on themselves than I would be. Um, and so, um, you know, I help kind of guide them to those consequences. But there's discussion around them and they're, they're agreed upon by the whole class. And then we post them for all of the class to see. So instead of reminding them of the rules all the time, they know what the rules are. They created them themselves. And it's much easier to get buy-in, especially when there has to be a consequence that's um, a negative consequence if students already know what those rules are and those consequences are. So the strong relationship between expectations and student achievement and, so, uh, and social behavior. So when the students know what is expected of them, they will achieve more, they'll have better social uh, behavior, and they generally will meet the bar that you set for them. So set, high, set a high bar, and it's okay. I think students will generally meet it, and you'll probably be surprised at some of the things that they are able to do if you have those expectations and that explicit instruction in place. So number four, teach skills. I think this is one of the most important strategies that we can make sure that we implement. I think many times our students don't know what the expectation is or how to do what is asked. Um, <clears throat> and even our higher functioning students, they may get stuck. They may get stuck on um, how to do something or how to process through something or maybe something has so many steps that they get stuck. So we really want to teach skills um, explicitly. Many times our students we hope will implicitly get social cues or implicitly get maybe how to line up without touching everybody in line. Some of our kids don't learn implicitly. They need explicit instruction. They need to be taught exactly what to do with their hands when they're lining up, exactly what to do with their mouth and get have pictures and all of those things. So when you're looking at skill deficits, you're going to ask yourself, what deficits does this student have in relation to their peers? What are their peers able to do that they are unable to do? And what skills can be taught to help them to um, be able to handle that situation better? What do they learn, need to learn to be successful across different school settings? So there's different rules at recess than there are in the library, than there are in uh, instruction time during class, than there are during maybe group group time, you know, where you work with your partners in a group. So what are all of those criteria that they need to know and what skill deficits might they have in those settings? And then, as I said earlier, what can the same age peers do that the student cannot? So skills to consider, and we're not going to go into a lot of detail on these, but just to get you thinking, can they regulate and, and identify their emotions and feelings? Can they self-regulate when they're feeling tired, when they're feeling anxious, when they're feeling stressed? Can they regulate those emotions? Do they have coping skills? Can they deal with what happens when someone takes the basketball away from them on the basketball court, but you just got it? How do they cope with that? Do they have those strategies? Can they relax? Do they have self-awareness and self-management? Do they have self-advocacy? Especially as our kids get older, we want them to be able to advocate that for themselves in a socially appropriate manner. Um, healthy thinking and self-talk. This is also more of an adolescent type of thing, but thinking about um, things in an appropriate way and telling yourself that, um, you know, a lot of our teenagers will are pretty down on themselves. So teaching them how to think healthy thoughts and, and treat themselves with respect and, and love for themselves. Do they have problem solving skills? If they have a broken pencil and you start delivering instruction and you notice that Johnny's not taking notes, and he said, you say, hey, are you going to take notes, bud? And he says, no, I can't. My pencil's broken. Well, does he have the problem-solving skills to know when the teacher's busy delivering instruction, what can I do, where can I get another pencil so that I can be successful in the classroom by taking notes like I should be? So do they have those problem-solving skills? If they don't, you may want to teach them so that the next time Johnny forgets his pencil or Johnny eats his pencil, um, he can get another one so that he can stay up with the academic um, portion of the class. 
social skills. And social skills is a huge skill deficit for some of our students. Um, so what kinds of things are they lacking in that in those social skills and really teaching them explicitly and over periods of sometimes months and years um, on using those skills, how to use them and when to use them. Relationship skills is a big one. Listening skills, functional communication skills, which I go into in a, a couple other s slides. Um, conflict, conflict resolution. How do we handle when someone's mean to us or when someone takes the basketball from us on the basketball court or when someone tells us they don't like our new haircut? How do we handle that and how do we cope with that and how do we handle that conflict? Um, anger management is a big one and executive functioning is, a, is another huge one for kids that have um, disabilities or have any kind of you know, emotional things that they're dealing with. <coughs> So as important as it is to teach academics and, and make sure that those test scores are all good and everything else, we really want to make sure that our kids have skills, especially skills to get through the, the day at school. Um, individuals with more skills are at lower risk for crisis behavior. And I'm sure that you can look around your school setting and see that kids that have more skills usually don't go into crisis. And kids that maybe have less skills in any type of area generally have more of a propensity to have crisis behavior. So as we mentioned earlier, and I put the LRBI diagram of the crisis cycle up there again, but in the calm phase, in phase one, that's where we want to provide the opportunities for instruction, development of those skills, and practice of those new skills. So this is the phase that the student needs to be in when you deliver your specially designed instruction for behavior. So just like we have specially designed instruction for academics, we should also have specially designed instruction for behavior. And, and promoting positive behaviors in the school setting. So whenever we're teaching a, a new skill or we're practicing, we want to make sure that the kid is in a calm, in the calm phase of the crisis cycle. Can you imagine what would happen if you brought a kid in who was maybe in the agitation phase and you came in and you said, okay, we're going to practice sharing the ball with Johnny today. And probably the kid's not going to be having it. He's kind of in a ticked off mood. He does not want to learn how to share right now. You need to do that when he's in a calm, happy, good place, and that's where you provide instruction. And, and really, um, what ends up happening is when you provide instruction in the calm phase, when they start getting triggered or in the anis, um, agitation or acceleration phase of the crisis cycle, that's when you can redirect them to, hey, remember when we're feeling anxious, remember we can take 10 deep breaths as we breathe in through our nose and out through our mouth. And you can kind of prompt them to um, go back to that previously learned skill that they learned while they were in the calm phase to help de-escalate their behavior. Um, and also in the recovery phase, it's easier to redirect the student to the previously learned skills to, bri to bridge the gap back into um, reintegration into the classroom. So when they're in that recovery phase saying, hey, I know you just had some anxiety there for a few minutes and we got through it and I'm really proud of you. Remember, the next time you start feeling this way, you're going to um, use your break card and show your teacher your break card and you're going to come down and talk to me. Or you're going to go wherever that student, um, you know, whatever program you have set up for that student, but they know where to go. And that it's just a reminder when they're going back into the classroom of, of how to use their skills that they already learned because they learned them when they were in the calm phase. So examples of skills that you may want to look at when you are looking at students that may have um, some lagging skills, you may want to look at if they know how to ask for things, if they know how to wait, if they know how to relax, how to get help from a teacher or a peer, how to play appropriately at recess or interact at lunch, how to take a break, how to walk down the hallway, all of those things, and none of those are academic skills. They're all skills that our kids need to learn to be successful, not only in the academic setting, but in life. So our goal is to maximize independence and success, not only in the school setting, but in the community and life. And I put this diagram on there primarily to show that behavior change does not happen overnight. Behavior change is just like academic growth. It happens slowly and incrementally, step upon step, line upon line, precept upon precept. It doesn't come overnight. It's got to be continuously worked on 
continuously reinforced and, and continuous teaching, just like you are when a student is learning how to read. Um, you teach certain things in a certain order so that they have the best chance at learning how to read. So one approach on how to teach skills um, is called BST, Behavior Skills Training. This is a really great practice that people use in um, applied behavior analysis. It has four components to it. Um, it's got the instruction, then modeling, then rehearsal, and then feedback. And a lot of times our kids that struggle with mental health challenges or disabilities or learning difficulties, they have a hard time remembering the rules and complying with the rules. And they may need ongoing supportive strategies. So just like I was saying in this last slide, teaching a student how to read, teaching a student behavior change is just like teaching the student how to read. They need constant ongoing support and, and being um, taught and, and being able to learn on those in those small increments. So I remember when I was in junior high and we had a class and we had to write a paper on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And, and many of you may remember something similar to that. But when we got our papers done, the teacher had a jar of peanut butter and a jar of jelly and a knife on, on the podium at the front of the room. And um, he stood up there and we had to read our paper in front of the class to teach him how to make the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And um, as you can imagine, sometimes we start off by saying, you know, um, put the peanut butter on the bread. And so he would take the jar of peanut butter and he would put it on the bag of bread. <laughs> we forget to say, open the bag, take two pieces of bread out of the bag, lay them face up on the table, open the jar of peanut butter, pick up your knife, put your knife into the peanut butter, scoop a tablespoon of peanut butter out onto the knife, and then put the knife on the bread with the peanut butter and spread it around. And as, as silly as that example is, that is explicit instruction. That is how our kids learn. They need some steps to be broken down into small, very micro steps so that they learn every little thing to making sure that that behavior chain, like a behavior chain of making a sandwich or the behavior chain of completing assignment and turning it in, that they know all of the components of how to do that. And that may take some time, but once you spend time up front teaching them that, they'll know it and you'll have to reinforce it less and less and they'll, that will become part of their repertoire and then you can work on other things. So the instruction here needs to be explicitly taught. It needs to be broken down into very small steps. Some students may need more um, uh, smaller steps than other students may need just depending on their their level of ability. Um, then the next step would be to model those steps. So instead of telling them how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you're going to model how to do it and you're going to talk through it. Oh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open the bread. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put the t separate the bread and lay it face up. So modeling what that's going to look like by doing the skill yourself. Um, and then rehearsal. This is where your student's going to join you and you're going to talk them through the two of you doing the steps together. So let's say you're teaching a student how to line up appropriately, you may go through a checklist of all of the components of the steps of lining up appropriately and then you're going to show them while you're talking through it with them, you're going to model for them how you line up appropriately and then you're going to rehearse. So you're going to line up appropriately together as a class and then you're going to get feedback. I really like the way that Carol lined up in line. She had her hands in her t down to her sides, her voice was quiet, um, she stood far enough behind her neighbor that she wasn't touching him and running him over. So providing that feedback and then practicing as, as much as needed to get that skill. So I have a couple of examples of how you can implement um, uh, behavior skills training. Remember it's the instruction model rehearsal feedback. So this may be your instruction slide that you might put up on your board for how to transition. So the teacher may say I'm going to give a three minute warning, um, three minutes prior to the end of class. What I want you to do is put your supplies away. You'll have to show them what that means, where the supplies go, do they go in the backpack, do they go in a supply closet, whatever that means. Um, you're going to turn your exit slip into the in bin. Then you're going to line up at the door with your folder. When the bell rings, you're going to wait to be dismissed by the teacher. And then you're going to leave the room in the line. 
You're going to go to the locker and change out your folder and your supplies if you need to. You're going to use the restroom and get a drink if you need to. You're going to line up along the wall um, in the hallway by your next class with quiet hands, feet, and voice. And then you're going to wait for that next teacher to invite you into their classroom. So that's the instruction. So you'll go through that very explicitly with however much detail you need depending on the, the needs of your class. Then you're going to model that. What does that look like? And so you're going to pretend you're the student and you're going to model those steps for them. And then you're going to rehearse. You're going to do it together. And then you're going to give feedback. What did they do well? What do they need help on? And give that, that feedback to them in, in positive terms. Um, here's another example, um, teaching students how to take a break. So you're going to go through this ins explicit instruction, put your break card on the desk in the right corner, so you don't even need to ask. You just take your break card, you put it on your desk in the right corner, you go to the designated break area in the classroom, you start the five minute timer, you use whatever supplies you need, so you may have fidgets or a weighted blanket or you know, different books or music in that area that the kids can use. They know how to get those supplies out. Um, they know how to use the timer. They're taught. Um, they use a quiet voice. When the timer goes off, you shut it off quickly. Put your supplies away. Return quietly to your seat. Put your break card back on the Velcro inside your desk because now your break is over, so it doesn't need to be up in the corner anymore. And then join the class activity. And then you model that, so you do that for the student. Then you rehearse that, you do it with the student, and you give them feedback while they're doing it, and teach them how to use the timer, teach them where everything goes, teach them what that looks like, and then you provide um, as much rehearsal and feedback as you need to until the student is proficient at taking a break. One thing to remember is as soon as they take a break successfully and they come back to class and join the activity, they get reinforcement. So whether that's a token or a sticker or praise, you know, thank you for coming right back to class and joining the, the class discussion, or I appreciate you coming right back to class. So make sure that you deliver reinforcement after successful completion of the break so that you continue to have um, successful behavior from your students. So strategy number five is using reinforcement. So um, reinforcement is things that we add to the environment that increases good behavior. So this is one reason why you need to know your students pretty well um, because if you don't know what types of things you can give them or say to them or do for them to increase their good behavior, then you might be shooting yourself in the foot. So for an example, we had kindergarten students that were earning stickers and they were earning stickers for all of the great things that they were doing, all of their wonderful behaviors, following instructions, um, singing the song with the classroom. Anyway, we got done with the activity and one of the little boys just went into a complete meltdown. <laughs> and so upon speaking with him when he was more calm, I said, well, what's the matter, buddy? And he said, I hate stickles. <laughs> I just thought, oh my goodness, here we are reinforcing with something that he hates. If he hates it, that's going to decrease his good behavior. And we don't want that. So we want to add reinforcement for him with something that's going to increase his behavior and, and he's going to enjoy. So those can be a variety of things. There's tons of free things. Um, there's praise. There's tokens that can be traded in for class store or activities or time playing with a fidget or all kinds of things. There's stickers. Older kids may choose to use points or there's coupons for different things. So what you're trying to do with reinforcement is catch them being good and catch them doing good things and giving them um, reinforcement, even a high five for doing something can be reinforcing enough to, for them to continue that behavior. So reinforcement examples. Uh, an elementary student earns a sticker each time she completes three problems on her worksheet. This increases her worksheet completion behavior. The sticker is the addition to the environment which is positive and the reinforcement is shown because her behavior increases. So the sticker is working for this student because her behavior is either maintained or it increases. So she likes the stickers. It's working today in this minute of today. And you guys all know that our kids change so rapidly that a sticker may only work this 10 minute period and, and next 10 minute period she may need something else. Um, a secondary student, Tom, struggles to make it a science class on time because his previous class is so far away. The teacher makes a point to praise Tom when he is on time for class. 
This increases the frequency that Tom arrives to class before the tardy bell rings. So the addition to the environment is the positive comment from the teacher. And the reinforcement is shown because Tom's on time more frequently. So he really likes the positive comment from the teacher and the um, appreciation that the teacher shows to him for being on time. Because it is hard to get all the way across campus um, to be on time for the class. And so the, co the positive comment is reinforcing to Tom and increases his behavior. So reinforcers are things that um, happen after the behavior that increase the chances of the behavior happening again. So these are three general categories. There's tangibles, things that you can hold in your hand, activities or things you get to do, or social is generally attention from others in some form. And we'll talk about those. Tangibles, um, teachers often make the, the comment, I can't afford to give somebody something every time they do something good. A tangible can be things that you have in a box behind your desk and the student can earn time with them. So time with sand or time with putty, uh, time with an art project. So it doesn't have to be something that you give to the kid and say, here, take this home. Congratulations on finishing a math problem. It can be something that they, they earn spending time with. So when you're trying to think about something that's reinforcing to a student, you're going to ask yourself, what does the student like to earn? What do they, they like? Um, is the size of the reinforcer worth the work? So this is a, a good example. You're not going to work doing your job for $5 an hour. The reinforcement has to be worth the work that you put into it. And so um, <clears throat> make sure that you're not giving the kid a Skittle for completing a 10-page math packet. You want to make sure that the size of the reinforcer matches the level of work that they have to, to do. Um, if you provide the reinforcer immediately when the student completes the task. So if the student says, hey teacher, I finished my math worksheet, and you say, okay, I'm going to give you a pizza coupon after school, no, you need to give it to them right then. The immediacy of the reinforcer is what connects the, the task completion to the, the reward. So it's really important that you don't put students off when they earn something. You want to make sure that you have access to that reinforcer immediately upon completion of the task. Um, am I providing the reinforcer frequently enough? And do I have a hierarchy of reinforcers? So this little um, graphic that I have here is, is showing that if you earn more points, you get better stuff. And so maybe a piece of candy, maybe five points, but if you earn eight points, you get a coloring break. And you may get 10 minutes as a, as a coloring break. And maybe coloring is more reinforcing than candy. So obviously, if the kid doesn't like to color, you're not going to want to have eight points as a coloring. Um, you know, you're not going to want that on there because it's not reinforcing. So whatever the biggest reinforcers are for the kid, that um, takes more points to earn that thing. <clears throat> Always pair anything that you give the kid, whether it's tangible activity or social reinforcers, make sure you always pair that with praise. Thank you for turning in your work. Thank you for sitting quietly in your seat while I gave the lesson. Thank you for helping your friend tie a shoe. Whatever it is that you um, are proud of that behavior, make sure you're telling them exactly what it is that they're doing that you like and that you appreciate. And then fading out the extrinsic enforcer, reinforcers for intrinsic value. So the, the, the premise of delivering praise with some of this more tangible stuff is that eventually, seems like about fourth or fifth grade, the kids don't really need or want the extrinsic reinforcers. Granted, they might want computer time, but they don't need so many little things to keep them engaged in the activities, a lot of times the praise in and of itself will be enough for the kids to continue showing good behavior. Here's some ideas of things that you can use for tangible social and activity reinforcers. I'm not going to go through all of these here, but um, any of these that the student likes, and that's the big thing, the student has to like it and want it in order to earn it. So make sure that they, um, you're delivering things that they, they want. So we're going to go over these pretty quickly, but these are additional tools to be used to prevent behavior. So these are tools to be used when the student is in calm phase and also to de-escalate any behaviors. So we can use these and we kind of 
put them on steroids. We put the intervention on steroids when the student becomes in an agitated or accelerated phase of the crisis cycle because then it really becomes imperative that we de-escalate them quickly so that they don't have a crisis behavior. So number six is appropriate and motivational instructional practices. So this is a universal strategy in the LRBI. It's number one. You want to ensure that your instruction and your um, activities in the classroom are not too easy or too difficult. If they're too easy or too difficult, you're going to have kids that have behaviors. So you're going to want to adjust as needed. <clears throat> and you should be giving pre-assessments and things like that to find out where your students are and where their deficits are so that you can manage their instructional level during the school day. <clears throat> Number seven is to change the student's current location when they become escalated. So you guys all know you've probably walked into a student that's um, becoming agitated. Sometimes it can be like, hey bud, come with me, let's go, I need to make some copies and I was wondering if you could help me. Or hey, will you take this stack of books down to um, the secretary in the office, she really needed these. Um, or hey, let's go take a walk for a minute, I need to talk to you about an assignment that I'm going to be giving the students this afternoon and I wanted to get your feedback on it. So sometimes just a, a change in location, um, not saying, hey, you look angry, you look like you need a break, let's go out into the hall. No, you want to do that in a, a more productive way and, and being there to support the student through that if they need. Um, so have kind of a list of strategies that you can do or use when a student needs kind of a little break from class. Engineering the environment to be more pleasant for the students. So this is universal strategy number eight in the LRBI. So making sure there's not too much noise, uh, making sure the lighting is appropriate, the temperature is not too hot or cold. I know that sometimes all of these things can be really difficult, but do the best you can. Making sure that students that may have anxiety um, are not sitting near high traffic areas or sitting by the door where they're distracted by everybody who walks down the hallway. So really being sensitive to the needs of the student as far as what can make the environment the most pleasant for that student so that they're more successful when I begin instruction. And then making sure you don't have too much on the walls. I know when I started teaching, I had all these cute wall displays and I had made posters and I had done all this cute stuff. The kids don't look at it anyway. I had a multiplication chart up for the year and when we got to the multiplication part in the math curriculum, my students didn't even know it was up there because they had never really looked at it before. <laughs> and so if you're going to put wall displays up, make sure that they're be the, the displays are um, needing to be used at that time and then take them down and put them up again when they need to be used or put something else up in its place that you're using at that time in your curriculum. Don't just have stuff up all school year that you're not referring to just to take up space on the wall because it's cute. Um, ensure any physical disabilities or limitations are accommodated for. So if the student is in a wheelchair, obviously, they need to be able to have access to a wider area in the classroom to get back and forth where they need to go. If the student is on crutches, they may need to have a space where they can put their foot up on a chair next to them um, or a place to put their crutches. <clears throat> Make sure if they have visual limitations, you know, if they, um, that they're sitting close to the board and that you ask them, hey, can you see from there? Sometimes classrooms are so small and we have kids pushed up so close to the board and then they're off to the side just enough that the board is just a big glare to them. They can't see what you've written on the board. So ensuring that those students that not only have visual problems, but especially them, um, but the kids can see the board. And I remember I walked into a classroom, a middle school classroom, um, a long time ago, and I walked in and I, I said to one of the kids who was on the very front row, on the very, very side, I said, hey buddy, can you see the board? And he's like, not even close. <laughs> and I just thought, the teacher's getting frustrated because the kid's not following the directions that he had written on the board, and the kid's not going to say, hey, I can't see the board, teacher, because he probably doesn't want to follow the instructions anyway. And it, so that wasn't working for them. So making sure that any kind of limitations that you know that your students have are accommodated for. And if you have a student that's sitting in the back and you notice them squinting or coming up to the board to see what it says, making sure you address that and get them the, the help that they need so that they can see the board and be successful. Obviously avoiding any situations or people that may be a trigger for the student. And here 
you also need to teach skills. So I, I remember a student that um, really didn't like a certain phrase. And all the other students pick up on that really, really quickly. So all the other students are whispering this phrase to this kid. They're saying it out at recess when there's less teacher proximity. Um, and this student would get really triggered by this and have aggression toward other kids and sometimes not even the kids that said it to him. So not only avoiding those situations or people that are a trigger, but also teaching skills. So you're teaching skills to the student that cannot tolerate that phrase and you're also teaching skills to the students that are delivering that phrase to cause the um, the aggressive behavior from that student. So you want to teach skills on both sides to avoid those situations that may be triggering for a student. And sometimes people may be a trigger, another student may be, maybe another staff member. So really trying to make sure that you're not creating a lot of anxiety for that student because um, you're trying to you know, make sure that everybody's by everybody else or, or you don't care if that student doesn't like that teacher, he has to go there anyway. Try to really make sure that you're looking at any situations that may become aversive for the student and you're trying to help them be successful and, and comfortable so that they can learn. Um, redirection from a problem behavior to a desired behavior. So this is a universal uh, strategy number 18. So <clears throat> redirection from a problem behavior to a replacement. So in um, applied behavior analysis we call it a replacement behavior. So that's the behavior that we want to replace the problem behavior with. For purposes of this training we're just going to say the desired behavior. So if we have a kid screaming for juice and that's the problem behavior, the replacement behavior would be to ask for juice or to sign for juice, whatever it is. But that's our desired behavior. We don't want screaming. We want appropriate asking. So um, I worked with a student years ago that would tantrum um, in math class. And we were trying to find out why. Why is he tantruming? He was actually really good at math. But we first of all had to look at, is it the instruction? No, the instruction was good. The student was on level for math. The student was actually really good at math. Then we looked at the transition. Does he have a hard time transitioning from the class before to starting math? Is that something that's a problem? We decided, no, that wasn't the problem. Then we looked at his sensory. Is he overstimulated? Is he overwhelmed? Does he need a break? Does he need to start math a few minutes later so that he can go get a drink or take a walk or do something so that he can regulate himself? We decided, no, it wasn't. So then we involved the student and we say, hey, buddy, I notice every time we start math, you have a tantrum. You have a total meltdown. You hide under your desk. What's going on? And he said, I don't like the little red box on the front of the math worksheet. And hello, that was eye-opening to us because we were looking at everything else that could be a trigger for him. He didn't want to do the math problem in the red box. So guess what we said? We said, guess what? Take this red pen and cross off the red box. You don't have to do that one. We didn't need him to do it. There was no reason to create that tantrum for him. So instead of having that tantrum, while the class was working through the, the problem in the red box, he could sit there and follow along. He did not have to write anything on his worksheet. He could just kind of take a break for a minute in his desk. And it worked for him, and it certainly worked for the teacher because his tantruming was, was over. Um, number 12 is to provide choices and to be flexible. So providing choice in choiceless situations sometimes um, so you want uh, the kid to write a three sentence paragraph. Can they use a pencil? Can they use a pen? Can they use a marker? I've worked with kids that want to use highlighters. I know that's more difficult to read. However, if they're doing the work and they're successful, I say, let them use a highlighter. So I've worked with a lot of students that um, the pencil is very aversive to them. The sound the pencil makes on the paper, the feeling that the pencil makes when it's um, writing on the paper, the feeling in their fingers. It's kind of like um, fingernails on a chalkboard to some kids. And then the smell of some of the pencils is just too much. So sometimes our kids really have some um, some struggles with some of those things and the teachers just need to be flexible enough to say, hey guess what, you don't have to use a pencil. How about you choose whatever you want to use to write with and then let's see if that works for both of us. So providing um, choices in those things. Also providing things, choices in things like, uh, <clears throat> I used to do um, math art 
every Friday. And so kids that had work to finish, I would work to help them finish it, and the other kids would work on an art project that incorporated math, math that we were working on. Some kids didn't want to do the art project. And I remember thinking, how can you not want to do art project and math? This is so awesome. I thought I was just the best teacher ever because I was letting them do art projects and math. Some of the kids don't want to do art right now, or they don't want to do an art project on math at all. And so giving them options so they could either do, um, you know, create their own math art, they could do a math worksheet, they could play math games, they could do a math, um, you know, diagram or like making a, you know, a roller coaster or something out of some of the, the toys and blocks and things that we had in there. As long as it was tied to math, I had to just be more flexible and say, sure, what options do you want to have and, and what options can we agree to and then teach them where those supplies are, how to access those things and tell them that they don't have to do math art. They can do math in a different format but right now is math time. <clears throat> um, ensuring all students can communicate their needs and wants. This is functional communication so this is you uh, 6F in the LRBI, it's also targeted intervention, number three. So they both kind of um, talk about different strategies for functional communication. But um, functional communication is, is that a student can, can communicate their very basic needs and wants. And um, a lot of times I think that we think our students have functional communication, but they may be signing break and asking for a break but they need to use the bathroom. Um, but they have a bathroom sticker or a bathroom picture right in front of them and they know how to sign bathroom, then why are they signing break? Because a break is a totally different thing than a bathroom. And so um, making sure that our kids have functional communication skills and I often um, have told people to try to go home and set your alarm for one hour and only talk or communicate your needs. And, and see how your night goes. So, um, you know, I need to go to the bathroom, I need a drink, I need food, I need back tickles, whatever it is, but how much you're missing and how much you want to communicate and how much else there is out there that a lot of our kids with limited skills can never get to communicate um, and how frustrating that must be to them <clears throat> at times. So please make sure that your students, whether they're lower functioning or very high functioning, if they're having problems communicating their needs and wants, whether it's pre-tantrum or, or just throughout the day ever, make sure we give them a modality to communicate. You guys have what's called the Utah Assistive Technology Team. Everybody, every school in the state of Utah is connected with Utah Assistive Technology professionals that can come in and do communication assessments on a student that you feel may need some assistive technology to, um, in order to communicate. So your um, principals of your building will know how to um, provide that those assessments and those permission to test and things like that if you feel like you have students that that need functional communication um, assessments. Also working with the parents or guardians to find out how the student communicates at home, what's the best method for them at home, and making sure there's a homeschool connection. So if they're using um, the LAMP system on the computer, making sure that they have access to that system at home as well so that it's across settings that they can um, be practicing with that because obviously the more you practice the more skilled you are at communicating effectively. Um, it will take de uh, delivering explicit instruction and making sure that instruction is appropriate. It takes a lot of time to to teach somebody to learn how to use some of these um, some of these computer systems and some of these things. So start out small and use the the most needed um, methods of communication for them like break and bathroom and can they communicate if they have a headache can they communicate if they're sick can they communicate if they're really excited because they're having a great day um, <clears throat> so making sure that they can communicate all those things to you and then making sure that there's adequate time spent instructing and practicing so that they can be fluent at that um, this is functional communication when there is a behavior 
you're wanting to see um, when where the problem behavior is and the function of that is it escape attention tangible or sensory and then we want to determine a replacement behavior for that so that remember is the behavior that we want to see so if they're escaping a task by throwing a temper tantrum you want to teach them how to ask for and utilize a break if they're trying to get attention by screaming and running around the classroom you're going to want to teach them functional communication by teaching them how to get attention appropriately so that might be a tap on the arm of the teacher raising their hand or saying teacher I need help whatever that is in your classroom but teaching them how to exhibit the behavior that you want to see um, in a functional way if they are having behavior because they want a tangible item maybe they want skittles then they can ask permission or they can earn time with a fidget or they can earn time reading to the classroom fish or whatever it is that they want you're giving them access to that and you're teaching them how to functionally communicate what they want and you're going to give it to them so um, and then there's sensory if they have sensory needs you're trying to give them appropriate strategies to fill that sensory need and here again is where you're going to want to work with an occupational therapist we have so many great OTs in our state and they love going in and trying to figure out our students and what they need to um, get their sensory needs filled. So the behavior that we want to see, the behavior that we're replacing the problem behavior with, it has to be easy, it has to be something they can do and it has to be reinforced every time they do it in the beginning. So if the kid is used to screaming and, and getting attention from the teacher, then when the kid screams you're going to teach him that in order to get your attention you want him to raise his hand so every time he raises his hand and he doesn't scream you need to reinforce it and remember reinforcement is something that's important to the student that the student wants not necessarily what you think the student wants so reinforcing him by giving him that attention and making sure that you do that and not make him wait um, in the beginning we generally reinforce every time and then we gradually fade that out we don't really have time to go into that today um, but you can't obviously reinforce every single time the kid says teacher I need you um, if he does it 50 times a day so it's gonna be every time in the beginning and then you'll gradually fade that out by saying um, I'll be right with you give me one second I'll be right over and so just making increasing the time between the hand raise and the time that you actually provide the attention <clears throat> um, 14 is uh, provide structure, daily schedule, reviewing the schedule daily, make sure they're aware of the class objectives. We talked about that a little earlier. Um, number 15 is to ensure instruction is appropriate. So this refers to like the pacing of the instruction. Is it too fast? Is it too slow? Um, this is the differentiation. Maybe you provide the instruction on a fifth grade level, but the student is on a third grade level for math, so you may provide a differentiated worksheet that provides um, third grade math level or whatever their instructional level is. And then uh, minimize your downtime. Also, just having instruction that's fun. Um, tell stories, tell jokes, have fun, give fun examples, watch fun little videos. Um, there's a lot of fun things that you can do rather than getting up and lecturing and we know students only retain about 10% of what we lecture anyway so um, do do some fun things in your classroom they'll learn more high rates of positive responses from teachers this is just teachers saying thank you for being in your seat thank you for being on time I appreciate you turning in your work that was a great comment all of those things if teachers have a lot of positive responses and they're giving them as a whole class or as uh, um, to the individual student behavior positive behaviors should increase and you'll have a just a great positive atmosphere and that's where everybody wants to be um, utilizing visual strategies whenever possible so some of these are for kids maybe that um, have more needs or for um, kids maybe in elementary school but a visual schedule a choice board so I can choose to do this or that um, if I do this then I get this or what I'm working for um, for our older kids it's transition expectations what does it look like um, give me some visuals on that how to work in groups so there's all kinds of different um, group strategies where maybe like mine in my class was lean look listen and 
oh, I can't remember, but um, having a quiet voice was the last one, but it was, I think it was the four L's, but I made visuals for all of those. And now you can buy all kinds of those visual things online, so it's really great. But showing them, showing them what it looks like to work in groups, showing them what their behavior needs to be for the recess, library, lunch, field trip um, settings. There are some good resources in the CHAMPS curriculum that have some great pictures that um, show students in different um, you know, times of the day what those expectations are. And really for high school students, you know, their visual strategies may be just the directions on the board. So maybe the teacher says, open up your, your science workbook to page 246. We're going to do all of the even numbers on that page. When you're done, I want you to get your science project out of the bin and work on that until the bell. So instead of just telling them that, some of our kids are distracted because their girlfriend is texting them and their phone is buzzing in their pocket and they may not hear all of that. So maybe the visual strategies that a, a middle school or high school teacher may tr uh, choose to incorporate is just a list of directions on the board. So first of all, this is what you're going to do. You're going to turn to page 246. Second of all, you're going to do the even number, answer the questions, the even numbers. So, um, you know, there's so many distractions these days that the more visuals that you can provide and the more instruction you can provide for your students, whether they have problem behavior or not, whether they have disabilities or not, the more strategies that we can give them for success, they will be more successful. High rates of praise, individual and group. Johnny, I love the way you raised your hand. Thank you. The group, I love the way the whole class is ready to learn and the tardy bell just rang. You guys are amazing. Verbal or is vocal, what I just said, you know, saying it and then nonverbal are your things like your high five, your thumbs up, um, you know, making sure that the kids know that you're proud of what they're doing. Um, using pre-teaching strategies to instruct and prompt for expected behaviors. So pre-teaching strategies may look something like, hey class, we're going to line up in one minute and we're going to remember to line up with our hands to our sides and our voices quiet. So reminding them, pre-teaching, prompting those expected behaviors so that they're successful. And then maybe when it's time up, one minute's gone by, you say, okay class, with quiet hands and quiet voices, please line up. So you're giving them those prompting strategies when you know that there may be a higher um, likelihood of problem behavior. <clears throat> check in, check out can be a couple of different things. This is a target intervention. This is, could be something um, as simple as this little visual that I have over on the side where a student will check in with a teacher during class and circle um, the level of um, engagement or, or whatever their goals are for that day. They'll circle, did I do it, you know, a zero, a one, or a two? A two would probably do, uh, you know, I did it most of the time. Anyway, if they end up with a certain percentage of points or whatever, they get a, a hierarchy of reinforcers. So if you get 70%, maybe you can choose to color or draw. Maybe if you get 80% accuracy, you get to, you know, choose to watch a couple of educational videos on the computer and if you get 90 percent you get to choose something out of my prize box and you have prizes in there that you know that they'll want. So um, <clears throat> check in check out helps the kids monitor their own behavior so that they can really see how they're doing um, and making sure that they you're setting them up for as much success as you can. Uh, preferential seating options, that's just making sure a kid is sitting in the spot in the classroom where they will be more su most successful. Teach and support self-regulation and mindfulness, coping strategies, thought process, all of those things are so important for our students. If you've got a social emotional learning program at your school, make sure that you have access to that. I think more and more we're finding that um, academics are um, harder to become engaged in if kids are having problems with social emotional things and a lot of our kids are. Um, the, the thought process is, is thinking through how you may want to cope with something or how you may need to self-regulate. So maybe your thought strategies. So I say, gosh, you know, I'm really antsy right now and my teacher's giving a lesson and I'm just not sure what to do with myself because I just want to bounce up and down on my chair. But I know that that will distract my neighbors and so I can't really do that. So how can I regulate myself? Oh, my teacher said that I could stand up in the back of the room and I can pace the back of the room and there's a duct tape um, 
line on the carpet for me that I can pace in the back of the room so that I can get my wiggles out while not distracting the rest of the class. So uh, modeling kind of your thought processes and, and helping them to get through some of their, their times that they need a little bit more support. Um, obviously extended time on assignments and tests. You know, be flexible. Give them some, some strategies where they can be successful. If there's 50 problems on the assignment, can they do 30? Do they have to show mastery of all 50? Can you know if they know um, <clears throat> the concept and they're proficient at the concept with, with doing less work? Um, and, and in test giving extended time, so saying, hey, you know what, you didn't finish before lunch, don't stress out about it. Um, come in tomorrow and I'll give you time. So just being flexible. Creating a social network of culture and respect. Um, you know, making sure the kids have friends and making sure that they respect each other for all of their differences. And I think we put a lot of time into this in, in elementary school. And then by the time our kids get into middle school and high school, we kind of forget to um, be teaching our kids how to, how to network with each other and how to respect one another and how to learn from one another and how to help one another. Um, sometimes I've worked with students and I say, hey, you know, what friends does this kid have? And the staff all says, well, no, no one, they don't have any friends. Well, what's reinforcing about going to school if you don't have any friends, especially if you're in middle school or high school? The reason I went to school when I was in those grades wasn't to do work. And it wasn't because I thought my teacher was super fun giving the science lesson. It was because I had friends there. And that was really reinforcing to me to go to school to see my friends. So making sure that you're helping network for those students, that will help reduce problem behavior if they have a network of friends. Teaching organizational and executive functioning skills. This does not need to be a class that's taught, but just helping kids be organized. How many problem behaviors would occur if you told the kid to turn in his English homework and he went to his backpack and he pulled out his English folder that was clearly labeled and he opened it up to the, the side that said homework to be turned in and he pulled out the packet and handed it to you. Now, in contrast, a student that does not have executive functioning skills, you may say, hey, please go get your English homework. And he may dig through his backpack and dig through his coat pockets and pull a bunch of trash out of his pants pockets, go to his locker, and as the picture shows up here, everything falls out. It's all stacked in there. He can't find his English homework, and he probably did it but he doesn't know where it is and he can't turn it in, are problem behaviors more likely to occur? Yeah, so let's give our kids the skills that they need to be organized and to, to um, learn how to do those things. I know I've worked with kids that um, <clears throat> we would start putting maybe a list together of, of steps that they needed to take or, or things that they needed to do when they got home or to do during a class and sometimes the kid forgets the list and I had one kid say to me, hey, can I just put this on my phone? And I went, oh yeah, you would never lose your phone. <laughs> and so your list is right there in your phone and you can set off an alarm to go off when it's time to do your reading and you can set an alarm to go off to remind you to brush your teeth. So, so we can teach our kids those simple skills that will really go a long way in helping them to become organized and that's a life skill. You have to be organized um, in, a, in order to function in our society as an adult. Um, 26 is home notes for academic and behavior. So this is targeted intervention number four. So I really love when students can earn reinforcement or they don't earn reinforcement, but I don't really like taking away or punishing. So if your student has a chart with smiley faces on it, maybe they can earn five smiley faces within an hour period and you are circling a smiley face for every time they demonstrate the, the behavior that you want to see. So maybe their behavior is raising your hand. So not calling out, but raising your hand. And your student does that and you circle those smiley faces. Well, maybe they only raised their hand some of the time. So maybe they only have three out of the five smiley faces circled. That means to the parent, when that home note goes home, my kid had about 60% accuracy on the hand raising behavior. That's okay. I, I hope it was higher. Maybe tomorrow will be better. But there's no frowny faces. There's no demerits. There's no taking away tokens that have been previously earned. Your student can earn the smiley face or they cannot earn the smiley face. But how would you feel if you got home from work and your husband says, okay, honey, let's see your 
your daily report and you say, oh, I got frowny faces, and you hand them your paper with frowny faces circled on it. I mean, no kid wants to go home with frowny faces in their backpack. So they can earn a smiley face or they don't earn a smiley face, but regardless, they're, they're not um, being punished with, uh, you know, frowny faces or demerits or tokens that are taken away. <coughs> Number 27 is be present, circle the classroom, supervise and monitor. You guys all know that proximity prevents behavior, so being close to the students. You're also there to offer help, so if you notice a student is becoming frustrated or a student isn't working or a student got number two wrong, you're there to supervise and say, hey bud, you wanna talk through number two with me so we can make sure you get the right answer. Um, so you're there to provide that support for them and that monitoring so that you prevent problem behaviors. As soon as the teacher sits down and starts answering emails, the spit wads come out, the poking comes out, the kicking the back of the chair comes out, and you guys have all seen it. It's kind of like um, save your emails for the end of the day or for your lunch period or something because you know as soon as you start checking those things, the kids are going to begin to have escalated behavior. Um, involve the student in their own problem behaviors. So letting them um, working collaboratively you know, with them to see what their behaviors are and how they want to solve them. Sometimes we can solve all the problems we want sitting in our staff meetings um, and, and our kids have just great ideas of they know what their deficits are, they know what they need. Sometimes they'll just tell you. So um, <clears throat> working collaboratively with them and Ross Green is the author of uh, the collaborative problem solving model. He has a couple of books. I think one is um, Lost lost and found in school. Anyway, it walks you through the collaborative problem solving model. I've seen this work from students as young as first grade with and without disabilities to kids that are adults. And it's an amazing strategy that it gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to implement. I think this is a brilliant model where you're collaborating with the student and teaching them problem solving skills um, so that they can solve their own problems when there isn't an adult around. Collaboration across school teams. Sometimes your, your OT or your speech pathologist or your PE teacher will have great strategies on how to deal with a student who may be exhibiting problem behavior. So making sure that you're working with all of those people um, and getting ideas for them and, and what's working. Sometimes we'll have schools that have three or four classrooms per grade. So for instance, maybe three first grade teachers all work with the same student during the day and maybe one of those teachers will say gosh I never have any problems with this student and then the other two teachers are saying all I have with this student is problem behavior after problem behavior what are you doing in your class she says well I just have him earning Pokemon stickers he'll do anything for a Pokemon sticker well making sure that those other first grade teachers know and the speech therapist knows and the OT knows so that when he's going across those settings they know what he's working for right now so that we can promote positive behaviors across the different settings in the school. Be flexible and understanding. I think we talked about that earlier. Communication with the student and with the family. So parents want to know what their kids are doing. They don't always want to know all the bad things. It's the worst thing ever to get that phone call every day at 4 o'clock telling you all the bad things your kid did that day. How about a phone call from something that the kid did really well that day? not all of our kids are bad all day long they do do some really wonderful things so maybe they helped appear maybe they held the door for the classroom to go to recess maybe they gave some of their lunch to somebody who didn't have lunch so making sure that you're communicating with the family um, about successes and even if they're small successes that you are, are communicating with them and and likewise the family also needs to know you know how the student is progressing as far as behavior things so I'm not saying to hide that from them I think you need to be transparent but I do think that you can also um, you know say hey we had a little bit of a rough day he only had 60 percent accuracy on his points chart but I did see him um, you know helping somebody at recess because they needed to have their shoe tied and he tied the his friend's shoe and I thought that was really awesome so um, 
kind of promoting some positive communication with the families is really important. And then having a safe place or a break area in the classroom. I know this is more prevalent in elementary schools, but I think if um, middle schools and high schools, it, maybe they don't have an area in the classroom, but maybe there's some sort of a protocol. If a kid just needs a break for a minute, that they get a break. And you know, as a teacher, that you go to the bathroom and you may sit there for a couple more minutes than you have to just to get a couple minutes of a break because you know that that's the only break you're going to get. And so providing those breaks or those outs, if you will, for a kid if he just needs a minute to gather himself, um, to collect himself before he comes back to the classroom. As you all know, data collection is very important. I know I'm guilty of thinking that a kid did something all day long this kid cried all day long, and then when I look at the data, maybe he only cried for 25 minutes collectively throughout the day, but it's so intense or it's so, um, you know, debilitating to the, the effective running of the classroom that it seems like it was much worse than it was. So make sure that you're collecting data. Make sure that you're also adding to that data collection sheet what strategies you're using and, and how the behavior is changing with that intervention. So as we talked about earlier, behavior change is slow. It can be very slow, but those slow little steps all lead toward that better behavior. And it's fun as a teacher to see, um, especially if steps happen in small increments, that eventually you've got pretty good behavior and you can start working on other things. So make sure that you monitor the progress of your interventions. And also, if you're using an intervention and it's not working, you don't want to keep using it. And three weeks later, you say, well, this just isn't working. Um, you want to change that out right away. <clears throat> As you guys know, we have the multi-tiered system of supports, or MTSS, at the State Board Office of Education. Um, these are not only for academic supports for students, but these are also behavior supports for students. So we're just going to review that really quick. Um, tier 1 is where all of the students receive that instruction on academics or behavior in the regular classroom. So this is our universal, or U, as you saw it on our interventions up um, in the slides previous to this. Um, so these, all of these Tier 1 supports are universal supports that you should do with all of the students all day. Tier 2 supports are students that aren't quite having the success that we would like to see in Tier 1. So they may need some reteaching. They ne may need some specialized instruction. They may need some tier um, targeted interventions, which are in the LRBI. So the student tracker is an example of one. So they may need something in addition to Tier 1 instruction that they can um, have to support those behaviors. So the important thing I want you guys to see in this slide is they get specialized instruction specialized behavior instruction. This may not mean a social skills group that you're hoping is gonna cover the behavior. This means what is their behavior, what do we need to do to intervene, and what, do the, what skills does the student lack, and how and when are we gonna teach that. Um, and then tier three is students who have not adequately pro progressed with the tier two interventions. They may need more intensive individualized instruction and interventions. So this is where maybe a functional behavior assessment or a behavior intervention plan may be put into place by a professional who's trained to come in and look at all of the data to find out really what the function of the behavior is, what things we can implement in the classroom, um, you know, to and, and what kind of instruction needs to happen. So just a note here that Tier 2 and 3 supports are given in addition to Tier 1 supports, not in place of. So we're not going to stop giving them the Tier 1 supports or the Tier 2 supports when they need Tier 3 supports. We're going to give them all three tiers of supports and we're going to make sure that they're receiving specially designed instruction for behavior every day as much as we need to have it delivered by the behavior specialist, the teacher, an administrator, whoever needs to provide that, but we're teaching the skills that the student needs in order to be successful behaviorally across settings at school. So as you guys uh, can see, we're at the end of our slideshow. I think the most important tool you can use is to be preventative and proactive and all of the strategies that we talked about today and all of the interventions are all research-based and evidence-based interventions to help reduce challenging behaviors in schools. 
um, whether the kid has a disability or not. These are wonderful strategies that you put in place before a problem behavior, remember, is the antecedent. So this is our prevention, and this is our de-escalation. So we put all these strategies in place, as many of them as we can. We went through a lot of interventions today. Um, I would say to pick two or three, maybe that you're already working on, and really just put those into some serious practice and, and really work on delivering those two or three interventions that you have for those kids. If you have kids that need more support than you can give them, make sure you are putting them into the RTI system and you're letting your administrators know. You're getting feedback from um, families. You're getting feedback from other people who work with the kid and getting some support for them in the classroom. And make sure you're offering that Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3 intervention when it's appropriate. So. Um, I, I know how hard you guys work every day. We appreciate you guys and, and the, the hard work and the efforts that you put into um, our students' success. And it does make a difference. And I hope that you guys will all be that teacher that makes a difference in a child's life and that they love the time that they had with you in the educational setting and that they were able to learn from you and that they'll invite you to their wedding and their graduation. So be that teacher who, who makes a difference for these kids, no matter how challenging they be, may be. Um, so this is my contact information at the USBE. My email and my phone number to my office are both listed there. And um, please feel free to contact me with any questions. If you feel like there's any professional development training needed at your building or for um, any particular group of, of staff, that you may need. We're happy to support you here. I work with Carol Anderson who's been here for a lot of years and she also is still working actively in the schools um, providing professional developments and trainings for for teachers and staff who need it for challenging behaviors in our students. So thank you for everything and we appreciate you um, joining this webinar and we hope you have a wonderful night. <laughs>